Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetective. I do want to encourage you to check out our other uh, podcast. And I want to mention today specifically public domain video theater at videotheater.greatdetectives.net, which is the video counterpart to this podcast. We're about to bring you an audio episode of Sherlock Holmes this weekend at video videotheater.greatdetectives.net, you can watch a television episode with Ronald Howard. And later on this month, an episode of uh, U.S. Marshall. We've got years of public domain television shows and movies for you, your viewing pleasure. So check it out over at videotheater.greatdetectives.net. Well, this episode of Sherlock Holmes, I honestly don't know how long it's been that I've not noticed this episode out there. I think I may have noticed it on some other site, and either it was mislabeled, and it was another Holmes pairing, or it was so bad it was unlistenable and unplayable. However, I was looking at a site where I look for old-time radio, and I saw this one, and I said, I don't remember playing that one. Let's see if that one is actually genuine. And it was. And we are back to the Richard Gordon era on Sherlock Holmes, which is the beginning for regular weekly uh, Sherlock Holmes broadcast in the United States. And this will actually be the earliest episode of Sherlock Holmes, uh, replacing Death at Stonehenge for that distinction. I will say that the audio is not pristine, but it's definitely listenable, and considering we're listening to something 90 years old, it's in, I, I would say, decent shape. Also, after today's commentary, you'll want to hang around as I will be announcing a special giveaway. All right, so all that introduction out of the way, we're going to get into Sherlock Holmes, sponsored by G. Washington Coffee, the original air date, May 19th, 1932, and the title is The Final Problem, but not really. We'll get into that after the show. Let's go ahead and take a listen. Every week at this time, the makers of G. Washington's Coffee bring you a story from the Sherlock Holmes series of mystery dramas. This week's adventure is an adaptation of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story entitled The Final Problem. Remember as you listen to it that G. Washington solves your daily coffee problem just as surely as Holmes solves his famous mystery. At the end of the program, we have a brief announcement about Dr. Watson and his friend Sherlock Holmes. Please listen for it. And that opening paragraph, as always, leads us to Dr. Watson's comfortable, hospitable study. Well, there's a blazing fire and a steaming cup of G. Washington coffee to welcome you. Here it is, Mr. Bell, made it. You came up the steps. Thank you, Dr. Watson. <laughs> you know, a good cup of coffee always seems to me to be the very essence of hospitality. You name me a better coffee than G. Washington's, Mr. Bell. Go ahead, name me one. Ah, <laughs> oh, but seriously, G. Washington's isn't just another brand of coffee. It's really entirely different. It not only has a perfect flavor, but it's the easiest coffee to fix. Just a teaspoonful in a cup, add hot water. Incidentally, you never make more than you're going to use, so that makes it economical, too. Right, Mr. Bell. Now, suppose I begin my story. Fine. What's it to be this time? How about another tussle between Holmes and Professor Moriarty? Excellent. Always give me plenty of first-class shudders to meet that individual. Well, tonight's story deals with Holmes' efforts to break up one of his most unpleasant schemes. A uh, racket, you'd call it today. And did he succeed? Oh, no, Mr. Bell, that's putting the cart before the horse. <laughs> the affair began <coughs> with a series of curious disappearances from St. Anthony's Hospital. Well, what disappeared, Dr. Watson? People or things? They were corpses, or perhaps I should say cadavers. Oh. No, before I go any farther... Perhaps I should explain that St. Anthony's is a medical school and hospital combined. I myself took my course in anatomy and dissection, 
inside its venerable walls. Sir Lionel Greatlake, the head of the staff, was an old friend of mine. We cursed our internship in the same hospital. But to make a long story short, I, I received a frantic communication from Sir Lionel begging me to persuade Holmes to come straight to the hospital. I remember that night perfectly. A particularly nasty pea super had settled down over London. Literally feeling our way, we crept along the embankment till we sensed rather than saw the grey walls of St. Anthony's looming up ahead. Hoghorns always have to sound so mournful. Well, Watson, you would insist on coming tonight. No, the staff entrance should be somewhere along here. <coughs> I stumbled over the doorstep. Where is that infernal bell? Oh, here we are. I hope the night watchman hasn't gone off in his rounds. No, no, someone's opening the door. Thank you, Watson. Uh, the fog, I can't see very clearly. No, it's me right enough, Leo. I brought Sherlock Holmes along with me. Oh, thank heavens. Come in, come in. Uh, oh, this is my old friend, Lionel Greatlake. Oh, delighted. Honored, and I may say grateful and relieved. Yeah, this is the sixth test inside the month, Mr. Holmes. Got the place in an uproar. Nurses have hysterics, patients insist on going home. I take it you are alluding to the cadavers which have been stolen recently. Yes, Mr. Holmes, you know how jealous a hospital is of its reputation. At least it a bit of scandal. Oh, and... cheer up, Leo. Maybe it's just a prank of one of the lads. You know what medical students are. No, no, that's what I thought when we found the first body missing four weeks ago. But now that five have been stolen, oh no, that's carrying a joke too far. They tried to get away with another this evening. Really? I just happened to drop into the dissecting room in time to stop it. The minute I opened the door, I knew someone was in there, but... He slipped out the side way before I could light the gas. Uh, but uh, come and see for yourself. Follow me. The, the laboratories are in this way. Oh, Morton Liam. <laughs> Looks familiar, Leo. Remember when we used to sneak a forbidden smoke behind that broom closet? I wish to heaven life were as simple nowadays. Deuce it faces like a beehive, buzzing with suspicion. No wonder we've been able to keep it out of the paper. Ah, uh, here we are. One second till I unlock the door. Uh, yes. Now, uh, just let me turn up the gas. <coughs> yeah. Well, there we are. Uh, quite impressive. I see you have all the latest improvements. Oh, uh, that gentleman in the corner. I take it he was the object of tonight's attempted abduction. Yes, Mr. Holmes, that's the cops. Splendid better than do. Face mm. a bit the worst for wear. Well, otherwise, a splendid body. Yes, yes, we're most anxious not to lose him. Mm, he must be fairly recent. I see there have been no injections of the preserving fluid. I right, right, Mr. Holmes. He died only this afternoon. Mm. And the other stolen bodies, they have been duly preserved, I suppose. Well, uh, no. Now that you mention it, they, they were all stolen before being treated. Curious, eh, Watson? Well, I don't know. I suppose if you're going to be a body snatcher, you might as well take fresh ones. Uh, you'll pardon me if I rummage around at the Trilano? Of course, of course. Yes, I, I can carry on my interrogations and my investigations at the same time. Okay, my, my lens needs polishing. Hmm. Uh, now then, uh, male or female? What? The stolen bodies with the male or female? Oh, uh, male, all of them. You're saying. Interesting, eh, Watson? You mean you think the thief's a woman hater? I wouldn't go so far as that. Uh, what age are the missing corpses? Oh, I don't know. Middling, I should say. Remarkably good lot of bodies, though. No mark to face, I mean. Uh, here's the last in care of Martini's instrument. Oh, that'll be Potter. Has some girl on his mind. Can't wait to get washed up and away. I see. And uh, and you found this uh, this specimen out here after the thief was scared off. Huh? I take it the cadavers aren't usually left lying about. Oh, certainly not. They're kept in that long steel cabinet over there. Can't be too careful, you know. Have to be rats in a building as old as this. And uh, how many people have keys to that cabinet, Sir Lionel? Only Doctor Lacey. Uh, you may know him by reputation, Mister Holmes. Uh, Hugo Lacey. He's our head surgeon and has charge of the classes in the thing. Of course, brilliant fellow. 
I say, Leo, how's he coming along with his experiments in transplanting tissue? I can't say. Carries on most of his experiments in a little laboratory he's fixed up in his own lodging. He never lets anything out till it's perfect. One of the cleverest surgeons in the country, Mr. Holmes, magnificent touch. I could wish, however, that he was a better professor. No, no, no good at teaching, eh? No, it isn't that. It's his temper. He can be devilish nasty. And let him catch one of the lads with an instrument bent out of place. <laughs> it's a phobia with him, Mr. Holmes. A place for everything and everything in its place. <laughs> Just young Potter says it seems to write before ladies see them. Oh, this is the door through which the thief escaped, I take it. Yes, and I, I bolted it on the inside, as you can see. Well, that's that. I think I've seen all there is to see. Found anything, Holmes? Yes, yes, there is what you might call an overabundance of clues. Too many to permit of any intelligent deductions. Why, what do you mean? Well, there are 14 sets of fingerprints, for instance. And in the dust, under that operating table alone, I found shreds of five different types of tobacco. Yeah, I'm afraid Mrs. Pratt is getting careless again. Oh, she's the cleaning woman, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Lacey is always complaining that she's inefficient. Well, Mr. Holmes, if you finished your investigation, perhaps you can advise us how we should act in this matter. Now, before I do that, suppose we come to an understanding. Would you be satisfied merely to stop the theft, or do you want to know who is responsible for the missing corpse? We must find out everything, Mr. Holmes. Who and what and how and why. A mystery of any kind is most demoralizing for a hospital. Well, in that case, we should do nothing further. Oh, but, oh, we should do nothing further tonight. But aren't you going to, uh, to set a watch on if this? If we did, the criminal wouldn't show up. You may take my word for it, Sir Lionel. The man who has been stealing your cadavers is thoroughly acquainted with the workings of this hospital. Uh, look here, Mr. Holmes. If, uh, if we don't set a guard on this room, he may steal this body, too. I sincerely hope so. Well, no use making things too easy for him. At least we can put the body back in the cabinet. Unfortunately, that won't be possible. We can't open it. The cabinet has a spring lock. The thief slammed it after him. Oh, dear, dear. What will Lacey say when he finds this corpse out here in the morning? Well, I don't think there's much danger of that, Sir Lionel. Really, Mr. Holmes, I am disappointed. I, I must say I hope you will be more helpful. Hmm. Well, there's one thing we can do for you before we leave, eh, Watson? No, what? Well, we can make up for Mrs. Clutch's deficiencies. Uh, if you'll get us a couple of old rags, Sir Lionel, I think Watson and I can go over this room in no time. Oh, have you gone out there now? Not at all, my dear Watson, not at all. It's most important that everything should be neat and tidy. Oh, Today, eh? Wind seems to have dissipated all the fog. Now, what's the idea of routing a chap out of his nice warm bed and the street still deserted? It's depressing, if you ask me. The important thing, my dear Watson, is in setting a trap is to collect your catch before anyone else does. Oh, here's St. Anthony's. Hello, hello. The Lionel seems to be having a bit of an argument with someone on the set. And I won't be put off the schedule by any poor minute seconds, you see. I'm going home now at six o'clock and eight and breakfast, but I'll be back. And when I do, I'm going to clean that room. But, Mrs. Clutch, I assure you... I'll that... find one you are to be put in charge. Everyone knows routine is what keeps an obstacle running. Uh, um, oh, what, Mr. Holmes, I didn't see you. Uh, come in. What's the matter? He's coming to you, I'd like to know. Oh, give me away, you. What? Here, I uh, beg your pardon. I am not to be put off his schedule. I'll tell you that, my soul. Yes, uh, that, uh, that was Mrs. Clutch. Uh, so I gather. Bit of a termagant, eh, Leo? Red hair. <laughs> Fairly blazing. Well, but come in. Come in, come in. <coughs> Sorry to give you such a stormy welcome, but I, I just caught Mrs. Clutch about to clean up the laboratory. <laughs> I suppose you want to take another look at the place. If it's convenient. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Follow me. Uh, I, um, I wonder why the sudden burst of energy on Mrs. Clutch's part. The Dr. Lacey may have been putting the screws on. If they get along like cat and dog, those two. But didn't I just hear her say that she was going home to fix him his breakfast? Yes. You see, Dr. Lacey is Mrs. Clutch's star lodger. But surely, if they get on each other's nerves, as they seem to... Yes, it is a bit difficult to understand, I admit, but... Oh, I suppose Lacey hesitates to move. He's, he's really very comfortable, and he's built in a lot of improvements, cupboards, and things of that sort. And I've told you how he is. A place for everything and everything in its place. Moreover, Mrs. Clutch is a first-class cook, and Lacey, <laughs> he's a good feeder. Well, but Lacey, I wouldn't push the old girl too far. I'd be afraid of finding poison in my coffee some bright morning. Well, here's your laboratory, Mr. Holmes. After you, gentlemen. Hmm. Looks about the same as it did last night. Well, I shall be able to judge better after I've gone over the place with my microscope. Must be 
that you said yourself there were too many fingerprints and things. Well, huh? why do you suppose I insisted on those rags last night, huh? No, of course not. See, now, we were rubbing out those things. Oh, marvelous, my dear Watson, marvelous. The old brain is actually functioning this early in the morning. Well, now, let's see what we bagged. Hmm. Oh, well, here, here. Here's the sleeping stroke of a mop. The very mop that has been standing in this corner. Yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. Here are the imprints of a heavy hand on the edge of this table. Note the unusual walls on the left hand middle finger. Like a question mark. But those must be Mrs. Cutter's fingerprints. She was just about to start dusting the table when I caught her. The prints in the mouth and on the table are identical. Well, 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 that seems to be all the evidence against Mrs. Platt. I got her out as quickly as I could. Holmes, I say, Holmes, the cop corpse. Gone. Uh, I wonder how soon you noticed that. The corpse has been stolen. But uh, what did you expect? <laughs> Sorry to contradict you, Mr. Holmes, but uh, the corpse has been put back in the cabinet. Oh, indeed. Yes. Uh, matter of fact, it slipped my mind. You should have mentioned it sooner. Seems Dr. Basie dropped in late last night. And insisted on putting the cadaver back in the cabinet. Nothing the night watchman could say would dissuade him. I told you about his mania for order last night, Mr. Holmes. Ah, these are doubtless his fingerprints, then. Here on the lock and around this panel of the cabinet. Ah, yes, typical surgeon's hand. Long, sensitive fingers, but strong. Tips slightly specialist. Yes, that's easy, right enough. But, Holmes, aren't you going to look inside the cabinet? Well, I suppose we might as well if Sir Lionel can provide us with the key. Certainly, certainly. Uh, Lacey left his with the night watchman. Uh, here we are. Why, Joe, the corpse is missing. Yes, I gathered it might be. Well, now, now let's see if we can find anything further in the room itself. Ah, here we are, here we are. Prince of the third set of fingers. Yes, yes, yes. He came in here earlier than Lacey. And those fingerprints of the door now. First this individual, then Lacey, and finally, Mrs. Platt. All nicely superimposed, one over the other. See, Holmes, this is fascinating, almost as exciting as a scientific experiment. Yes, yes, this third individual had not any too steady. Ah, here, here he stumbled and had to put his hand out to break himself. Here's a nice print here on the wall. Mm. He moves over to this jar of alcohol. He removes the cover. Then he puts it back again. And here, here he staggers out. You mean he was intoxicated? Beautifully, beautifully. Yes, but I don't understand. Why in thunder did he come poking around, around here in the middle of the night? Well, what, have you no recollection of your own green salad days? Did you ever sneak a bit of uh, laboratory's alcohol to help out a celebration that had suddenly gone dry? Well, one of the students, eh? <laughs> Any idea which one is the home? Well, I think I can make a guess, but I don't intend to. The boy isn't mixed up in this body snatching. The corpse was here when he left. His prints are under laces on the doorknob. Oh, what is it, Potter? Oh, I, I just thought I'd slip in and uh, polish up uh, my instruments before the picture gets... I, I beg your pardon, sir. Uh, before Dr. Lacey gets to look at them. Uh, I'll come back later. Well, not all, not all. Come right in, come right in. We're just leaving. Yes, but Holmes, we haven't discovered anything. Oh, what we have, what we have. We know for sure that either Lacey or Mrs. Clutch is involved in this business. Possibly both. Yes, yes, sir. I suggest we go to pay the Clutch menage a visit. Well, I'll be glad to take you over myself. Uh, what are you, uh, you look a bit fagged this morning. Uh, I'm all right, sir. A bit liverish, that's all. <laughs> well, don't let it get you down. Uh, come along, Watson. Oh, uh, Miss Farrer. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, uh, they tell me tomato juice is an excellent antidote for raw alcohol. <laughs> This place over there, the, the house with the white shutters. Now look at that crowd of people standing gawking out in front. I say, looks like something's happened. Yes, yes. There's my favorite watchdog of the law, Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard, standing in the doorway looking important. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello, Lestrade. Uh, what's up, eh? Uh, plenty. A woman by the name of Klutz has just murdered her lodger, Dr. Lacey. Well, I told you she'd do it someday. Mm, any unusual details? No, open and shut case. First, she stabs him with a kitchen knife, then she throws the body, clothes and all, into a vat of magic ice that this bloke was keeping in his dressing room. Indeed. Any objections if I come in and take a look around? Mm, all right. But I tell you, this case is open and shut. But come in, come in. Body's in first room, head of the stairs. It's not nice, but if you want to look, go ahead. I got to stay here. Oh, thanks, thanks. What a vile odor. <laughs> Chemical smell, plus something else. Oh, well, that'll be the acid. Look out, look out, stairs are dark. Holmes, Holmes, do you hear that noise? Like something bubbling and crying? Yes, yes, that's the acid, the working on the body. 
coffee. Smell its acid and fat dissolving. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, that must be the room. Oh, good morning, Jenkins. Jenkins, good morning. The squad sent you here to guard the body, eh? Yes, sir. Hey, this air, oh, Jenkins, Jenkins, I think you might open another window. Get a draft through here. Yes, sir. Now, Watson, uh, if you'll bring me that jug labeled olive oil, you may as well stop the action of this acid. You're right. Yes, sir. Pour it right into the tub. Mm-hmm. Hmm. As Estrade said, the remains are not exactly attractive. I wonder, Mr. Lionel, if you could uh, bring yourself to uh, to identify Dr. Lacey. Oh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. I'm a medical man. I'm quite used to... Uh... Uh, yes, <laughs> It's rather horrible. Face almost entirely eaten away. And with the dark hair, what was left of it, and the clothes and that ring, he never could get it off his little finger. Yes, yes, I think we may safely say that it's lacy for devil. Well, Jenkins, how was he killed? Kitchen knife on the table there, with his clutch fingerprints plain as day. <laughs> so Lestrade has been persuaded to the value of fingerprints, eh? Dear, 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 the world does progress. Yes, yes, yes. These are Mrs. Clutch's prints, all right. Oh. Very well, Joe. I'm here. Bring Mrs. Lovelock. Why didn't you go? Didn't get any answer. Oh, I didn't kill him. He was dead when I come in. He was dead at me. None of your lip and get going. Well, uh, let's try just a moment. I'd like to ask this uh, this lady a few questions. He was dead when I found him. Is it likely I had to call in the police if I did it? Oh, you call in the police. Well, that she did. Leaning out the window, screaming bloody murder. You know, any idea who could have killed Dr. Lacey, Mrs. Platt? No, sir. I gave been over all night. On account of my sister's having a baby, I went straight from her place to the hospital. Oh, you had any chance to check up on that, son? Oh, that's straight enough. But she'd been home at least 20 minutes before she called the police. Time to murder half a dozen doctors. I didn't do it, Dr. Now, you know, Lestrade, it's just possible that Mrs. Crutz may be right. Huh? You see, it would take several hours for acid to dissolve the corpse as far as this. What all of it? Her fingerprints are on the knife? That's enough for me. Hers and no one else. And why shouldn't me fingerprints be on that knife? It's my own kitchen, I think it. Well, that knife, uh, suppose you look at it again. Now, what in blaze is good? Now, uh, notice the order of the fingerprints, for instance. Thumb and forefinger near the blade end of the handle. Now, uh, suppose suppose you take this pocket knife of mine and uh, and pretend to stab me with it. Now, this is just a lot of... All right. There, now, you see? Notice the way you hold it? Thumb against the outer end, little finger next to the blade. In other words, the grip for using a knife for kitchen work and for stabbing are exactly reversed. Dr. Lacey was not stabbed with this knife at all. It was put here by someone to incriminate Mrs. Clutch. Yes, but if she didn't do it, who did? Someone who wanted to get rid of her. You any idea who that could have been, Mrs. Clutch? No, sir. That I haven't. The only person mean enough to do a thing like this is that son of a gun, Lacey. And he's dead now, Lord rest his soul. Oh, dearie me, it's not bad enough having a murder in my own house and then losing my best lodger. But the police have to go accusing me on top of it all. That is not I'll never get another tenant of these rooms. Well, all that is so much prof, my dear Mrs. Tut, compared to the real danger you're in. What's that? The murderer. He's still at large. And he isn't exactly fond of you. I think I'll just drop in from time to time to make sure you haven't been murdered in your bed. Think Mrs. Putz is in danger? Obviously, Watson. Obviously, come on it. Why didn't she answer the bell? If anything's happened, and... oh, there, here, here, here she comes. Oh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Please to step inside. I had to come to the door sooner, but I was upstairs feeling out Dr. Lacey's suite. Would you believe it? I've got a tenant. You don't say, you don't say. Well, does he know its history? Yes, sir, that he does, but he says he's not superstitious. Oh, fortunate. What's he like? Well, he's a German. Professor or something. Come here to carry on some experimenting with Dr. Lacey. Dr. Lacey told me he was expecting him only last week. And so when he come out for Lacey this morning and I told him what had happened, right away he asked if Dr. Lacey's notes and instruments were still here. And when I said yes, he said he'd move right in and carry on with Lacey at all. Would you mind coming upstairs while I finish my work? Well, lead the way, Mrs. Clark, lead the way. He's a nice-looking man, too. Blonde with a beard. He limps a little. Oh, it'll be a relief, I tell you, after that, Lacey. He was getting queerer and queerer going out at all hours of the night. I declare I was on the verge of telling the police to keep an eye on him more than once. Well, here we are. Just to sit on the sofa. Now, what in the name of... Well, from what I can see out the window, I should say that your new lodger has arrived. Thanks, preserve us. Excuse me, gentlemen, when I let him in. Holmes, I think we'd better be going. In a moment, Watson, in a moment. Tell your time. This way, please. Look up to the tenant's chair. Oh, why, ain't he talking? 
Professor Gluckfeder. How do you do? Delighted. Sorry I had to come all this way and then find a friend dead. Ah, uh, he is no friend. He is what you call a, a colleague. Uh, Mrs. Phelps, the poor man who on the bed. Yes. Well, I know Mrs. Potts will make her comfortable. I uh, trust you had better luck than Dr. Uh, him. Uh, uh, come, Watson, come, come. We must be going. You see, Professor Gluckfeder, uh, we were the uh, the detectives on this case. Don't you have found? Nothing, I'm afraid, nothing. Hmm. Oh, these are my notes on the case. I'm really rather ashamed of them. Uh, would you mind if I, uh, if I burn them here in your fireplace? Oh, not at all. Thank you, thank you. Oh, dear me, dear me, dear me. I don't seem to have a match. Now, uh, one moment. I'll get you some here. Here in the drawer of this table. Ah, here you are. A nice little box. Thank you, Dr. Lacey. Huh? I thought you would know where to find them. A place for everything and everything in its place. Yes, I was sure you would be drawn back to these rooms. Me? You think I am Dr. Lacey? He is dead. Murdered. No, that wasn't Dr. Lacey in that tub of acid. It was one of the bodies he had stolen from St. Anthony's. It had a rather curious confirmation of the bones of the right foot. I've seen it the night before, so of course I recognized it. Your misfortune, Dr. Lacey. But he's foot, sir. What is all this rubbish? Well, you see, it came to my attention not long ago that Professor Moriarty was getting in touch with quite a number of heavily insured businessmen. One after another, these men died. But by and by, the insurance companies became suspicious. I was told to investigate. I discovered that on several occasions, Professor Moriarty had called on Dr. Lacey. Dr. Lacey, who was experimenting with facial surgery. Dr. Lacey, who had access to any number of corpses from St. Anthony's. Well, in time, I began to suspect that Dr. Lacey was working on these dead bodies and transforming them so they would look like the gentlemen who wished to collect their insurance. Hmm. Professor Moriarty made a handsome profit, I believe. Unfortunately, though, I... I couldn't prove my theory. It is crazy. No one would believe it. Oh, so I found. Ah, then what good does it do you? Just huh? this. When you're in prison, the whole scheme will fall to the ground. But I am not Dr. Lacey. You have no proof. There you are wrong, sir. This little matchbox which you just handed me contains all the proof that I need. On it is a set of fingerprints, which is identical with some on the cabinet door in the laboratory of St. Anthony's. And those fingerprints are known to be Dr. Lacey's. Oh. It's magnificent. Oh, elemental. Phenomenal. Elemental, my dear Watson, elemental. And that's the end of the story, Mr. Bell. But Dr. Watson, didn't the man ever confess? He did better than that. He offered to show up Moriarty. But when they came to take down his testimony, he was found dead on his prison cot. Obviously, more of Moriarty's work. There's one thing I don't understand. Why didn't he take the same way out as the businessman? Surely he could have doctored some corpse up so it looked like himself. He could have, Mr. Bell, but that's where human nature comes in. He hated Mrs. Clutch, so he wanted to implicate her. It was his big mistake. <laughs> well, that certainly is a fascinating story, Dr. Watson. Now, now to get back to something where there are never any mistakes. I know what you're hinting at now. Another cup of G. Washington coffee. Yes, indeed. Dr. Watson, have you ever stopped to consider how much the word economy has come to mean to Americans during the last couple of years? It's come to mean more to me, too. I have to save on a lot of things I never thought about before. How do you do it, Dr. Watson? Does it mean giving up all the good things in life and using cheaper quality? Not at all, Mr. Bell. I still keep to the good things, but I'm a little more careful how I use them. More satisfaction in being a little careful with good things, you know, than in putting up with poor quality. Oh, by the way. <laughs> what is it, Dr. Watson? You're, you're chuckling over something now. It's only fair to tell what it is. <laughs> well, a, a lot of people have been taking a lesson from Sherlock Holmes, Mr. Bell. They've, they've been drawing deductions. About what? About my book of Sherlock Holmes stories, Mr. Bell. They've been observant enough to notice the little number one on the back of the volume. And they want to know if there are if they're going to be other books. There's more stories in them later on. I'm afraid I'm not very observant, Dr. Watson. I never noticed that little one. And are there going to be more stories? I can't tell for sure, Mr. Bell. I've been talking it over with Mr. Washington. But just in case there are, I want everybody to get volume one right away. So they won't be left when the first edition runs out and be unable to make up their complete set. That's right, too. We'll have to warn them about that. Especially with that economy we were talking about. It's worthwhile getting a really good book for nothing. Well, what about G. Washington? Is that economy? Of course it is. You know a Sherlock Holmes story about the rich old mustard manufacturer, aren't you? I know, Dr. Watson. I can't say that I do. Well, it's a good story. It applies to saving money on coffee, too. It seems a smart young man, who thought he was smart anyway, asked the mustard king if he really made all his money out of the little bit of mustard people use on their food. And what did he say? He said no. 
that we've made most of it out of the mustard people leave on their plates. And that's just the way it is with coffee, or ordinary coffee, huh? You mean the real expense is not what you drink, but what you waste. Exactly, and that's where G. Washington saves. There's no waste. You only make what you want, and yet you can have all you want. Well, that sounds like economy, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Watson and I want you to test G. Washington economy. Get a four-ounce can right away. Don't be afraid of the size of the can or the price. G. Washington is economical because it ends waste. And as a special inducement, why, Dr. Watson will give you one of his books and seven Sherlock Holmes stories. Just print your name and address on the back of a label from your four-ounce can and send it to Morristown, New Jersey. You will receive, without cost, a handsome Duke book with a gold profile of Holmes on the cover and a picture of Dr. Watson at the front of the seat. In that way, you'll have the satisfaction of proving to yourself that G. Washington won't wreck your family budget and of getting a handsome book of Sherlock Holmes stories for nothing. Please note down the address, Morristown, New Jersey. And send in that four-ounce can label right away so you won't be left without volume one if the good doctor persuades Mr. Washington to wish in volume two. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week's story? Next week, I'm going to tell you the story of a man 20 years older than his bride and how death came to Rose Hill. Now, in answer to the numerous requests, we want to announce that the Sherlock Holmes program has been on the air for three years. The part of Sherlock Holmes is played by Richard Gordon, that of Dr. Watson by Lee Lovell. Neither Mr. Gordon nor Mr. Lovell play the part of the detective and his doctor friend in any other program. Welcome back. I actually really enjoyed this episode. It does a great job capturing the kind of spirit and style that makes Holmes so appealing. In this episode, we hear him doing things that his compatriots don't understand, and we, the audience, don't understand at first. Because he's got this so very different view of the world and of the case. His mind is moving in different directions, and I totally love how uh, they managed to capture this. Holmes is just so much fun in this episode, and I think that uh, some uh, listeners commented on the fact that Richard Gordon's performance was quite a bit different than so many of the later Holmes radio stories. And I think that's because Gordon, if he's influenced by anything, and I I think the same can be said for Lewis Hector, who would follow him in the uh, Sherlock Holmes role, he was influenced by William Gillette's uh, performance and the, the stage plays and the way that those were... Uh, perform. Basil Rathbone came along and really just decided to do his own thing, to take the role and to offer his own interpretation and make it his own. And then uh, most of the Holmes actors, uh, until at least Ben Wright, just essentially decided to go ahead and try and imitate Basil Rathbone. Much to Rathbone's uh, annoyance, but that's another story. Speaking of another story, uh, those who have read through the uh, Sherlock Holmes stories will be scratching their heads at the idea that this is an adaptation of the final problem. I talked about this, you know, a decade ago, if you remember, before we were at episode 1000, like episode 09-something, when uh, they did the final problem in the John Gilgood ralph Richardson series. And that series really tried to be extremely faithful to the source material. The problem with the final problem is that it is so exposition-based. There's not a whole lot of uh, 
action or character interaction. It was something that Doyle wrote as a way to escape writing Sherlock Holmes stories. Not as something that he expected to be, you know, dramatized in some full detail. So it's very tough to dramatize. Uh, and so I think many of the New Adventures writers, and particularly the writer of this story, decided, you know, let's just go ahead and we're introduced to Professor Moriarty in the final problem, but we don't actually see Holmes busting up uh, Moriarty's operations and how fiendish those operations were. So let's go ahead and tell a story of Holmes doing that. Now, of course, in terms of the canon, that presents some problems in that in the final problem, when Holmes references Moriarty to Watson, uh, that was the first time that Watson had heard of him. But I think that uh, Doyle uh, kind of created some of that within the canon, so I guess we can forgive the writer of this episode. The disclaimer at the end about uh, the stars of the program not appearing in any other uh, program as a crime-solving uh, detective and his doctor friend was intriguing, and I did a little bit of research, and I have no idea what exactly it was about. Though I can kind of uh, speculate. It was 1932, which was still very much a Wild West era for American radio. The great radio networks were still just getting established. There was a lot of chaos in the radio medium and some shady operators. It's not inconceivable that with the success of the Sherlock Holmes program, which uh, by, according to this, had been on the air for three years, that someone decided, you know, we have a couple of actors who sound really similar to the Holmes and Watson characters. Let's go ahead and put our own detective series on the air and see if we can cash in on it. And then someone writes into G. Washington Coffee and notifies them of this, and you get that sort of announcement at the end of the program. Might also get some lawyers involved as well, uh, particularly since the character of Sherlock Holmes in 1932 was very much under copyright. But alas, I could find no details as to what sort of drama went on, if any, on this. Worth noting here, Joseph Bell, who hosts this program, would be the host of several uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, programs. In fact, after Petri Wine left as sponsor of uh, Sherlock Holmes, along with uh, Basil Rathbone leaving, he served as the host uh, during the Tom Conway, Nigel Bruce era, 1946 and 47 for Kreml Hair Tonic. The book premium really caught my interest. It was such an interesting promotion as G. Washington Coffee issued its own special edition of Sherlock Holmes stories. Seven stories selected from the Holmes canon, and I thought it would be interesting to have a copy of it. It's a great piece of radio history from the very first long-running Sherlock Holmes series. And I thought it would be even more fun to give listeners to the podcast a chance to own their own copy. So I bought a copy of the book off of eBay, and it is going to be a prize in the first ever giveaway I've done on the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. You can go to giveaway.greatdetectives.net and enter to win this book along with four other prizes. So let me go ahead and I will talk about the book itself. The book contains seven Sherlock Holmes stories. On the title page, it's listed as the G. Washington edition, and it includes The Adventure of the Illustrious Client, The Adventure of the Blanche Soldier, The Adventure of the Mazarin Stone, The Adventure of the Three Gables, The Adventure of the Creeping Man, The Adventure of the Sussex Vampire, 
and The Adventure of the Veiled Lodger. So most of these are some of the later Holmes stories. But that's not all. While doing some research, I found out that G. Washington Coffee had issued an earlier high-end book. A copy of The Hound of the Baskervilles. This one is also uh, labeled as the G. Washington edition. It was printed in 1930, and it features a picture of star Richard Gordon in addition to the text of the novel. I, I think I would classify the condition of each of these books as in good condition. They are far from men. There are things along the cover and and some wear, particularly on the binds of the books. They're both hard covers. They're not worth a fortune or anything. But they're fun things to have. A nice piece of radio history from the first American uh, Sherlock Holmes series over radio. The first prize is choice of the two books. The second prize is whatever the first place winner didn't choose. Our third prize is the new Great Detectives of Old Time Radio pullover hoodie. Yes, we're going to have a new t-shirt design for the first time in I think three years. What will it be? Stay tuned. And we have two fourth prizes, which are a t-shirt in our latest design uh, to be announced in the fall. So to enter, go to giveaway.greatdetectives.net. You can get one entry without having to do anything. All entries are free, and you can earn an additional entry by uh, visiting our website or by doing some tasks to help us on social media. So check it out at giveaway.greatdetectives.net. The deadline for entry is Saturday, August 27th, the winner to be announced Tuesday, September the 6th, or I should say winners. Uh, so uh, look forward to having uh, your entries, and of course we'll uh, send out the books as soon as we confirm the information from the winners of the first and second prize, and get the sweatshirts and t-shirts out as soon as is practical once we have everything finalized. And we'll be talking more about those designs uh, coming up uh, later on. Well, now let's go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Delilah. Patreon supporter since December 2019, currently supporting us at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, Delilah. And that will actually do it for today. Next Tuesday, we'll be bringing you a previously uncirculated episode of Defense Attorney. But join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... What do you see there, Monsieur Mitchell? Just a black sedan, man in the back seat, and driver in front. The man in the back seat was the diplomat who was assassinated shortly afterward. Hmm. Now, look more closely at the driver. What? Hey, it's Captain Rock. Captain Rock. You may turn the lights back on now. Ah, merci. You think Captain Rock killed that diplomat? No, but we think he was in on the plan in some way. At a certain point in the trip, instead of turning to the left, as he was supposed to do, he suddenly turned to the right, into a blind alley. That is where the shooting took place. I see. Well, then, if Rock was in on the plan, that means he knew who killed that diplomat. That is precisely the point, Mitchell. We believe that interests hostile to that treaty deliberately assassinated that diplomat to block the treaty. Your commissioner also believes that if they can be exposed for what they are and linked to the killing, then the treaty has a chance of going through after all. Yeah. Well, what happened to Captain Rock after the shooting? Interpol in Paris has supplied us with that information. I have it right here. Rock hmm. uh, went into hiding. He was arrested on a minor charge in Istanbul two months ago and imprisoned there. He probably figured that that Istanbul jail was a good hiding place. Oh, undoubtedly. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.